It's great to see everyone here this morning. Good to have our visitors. We want to say welcome to you. Glad that you've come out to worship with us and and to praise God and to learn some more about uh, His Word. Some might remember a song that was written back in uh, 1962 by Kitty Callan. Little things mean a lot. Anybody remember that song? Little things mean a lot. In the song, uh, the singer was getting across the concept that the little things you do in a relationship mean a whole lot. Whether it's holding your mate's hand, whether it's saying I love you, writing a note, sending a card, maybe a flower, maybe a rose, something of that nature, that, that those little things she was saying in a relationship mean a whole lot. Well, in the Bible, little words mean a lot. Sometimes the meaning of an entire verse or a section of Scripture can hinge on the meaning of a small word. Little words mean a lot. As we have up here on the board, there is one word, a very small word, with only two letters, if. And that little word in the passages that we're going to look at this morning mean a whole lot. It's a small word, but it means a great deal. And it's key to understanding the entire verse or the entire section of Scripture. It's usually connected with an if-then phrase or statement. If this, then this. It's a conditional clause that functions as part of a predicate in that they are given a condition under which the action of the verb can be taken place, a reason or cause for the action of the verb taking place or not taking place. Well, that's a little bit of English for you, a little bit of language study. But it's simple, and we use it all the time in our everyday language. If you touch the stove, you will burn your hand. If, then. If you touch that stove, you're going to burn your hand. If you mow the lawn, you'll get an allowance. Sometimes the then doesn't even have to be there. But it's implied. If you do this, then this will happen. If you don't, then this will happen. An if-then statement. And that little word if makes the statement conditional. Conditional. Little words mean a lot. Look at John chapter 8. John chapter 8. Verses 31 and 32, Jesus is talking to the Jews, some of whom which believe in Him, and some who do not. John chapter 8, verse 31 and 32, the, the Gospel of John was written to, to prove the deity of Christ, to prove that He was the Messiah, the very Son of God. And in John chapter 8 and verse 31, then Jesus said to those Jews who believe in Him, if you abide in My Word... You are my disciples indeed. Verse 32. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Notice that little word, if. It's an if-then phrase, even though the word then does not appear there. If you abide in my word, then, it's implied, you are my disciples indeed. That little word, if, that small word means a condition. Here's the condition of being a disciple of Christ. Abiding in my word. The word abide means to dwell within. If you abide in a house, you're dwelling in a house. And so Jesus is saying here, you have to live, you have to abide in my word, what I teach. If you do that... Then you will be my disciples indeed. You'll be my true disciples. 
That word disciple means one that is disciplined, one that listens to the words of Jesus Christ, disciplines themselves, and follows Jesus. They're a disciple of Jesus Christ. And if you do this, then you'll be my disciple. And he says in verse 32, connected with that, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. A little bit later on in in the the chapter, the Jews are, are confused about that. Because they think he's speaking of physical bondage. He's saying anyone who sins, Jesus later on in the, in the chapter will say, anyone who sins is a slave to sin. I have come to set you free from sin. And if you abide in my word, you will be my disciples. You will know this truth, and this truth will make you free from the bondage of sin. But it's conditioned on that one little word, if. It's a condition. Little words mean a lot. Look at John chapter 14. John chapter 14, verses 15 and verse 23. We find again this little word that conveys so much. Jesus said, If you love me, keep my commandments. Again, another if-then statement. If you love me, keep my commandments. He's basically saying the same thing he said in John chapter 8 and verse 31. Abide in my word. If you love me, if you truly love me, then do what I command you to do. Do what I say. Verse 23, Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And my Father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. Here you have two words there. The if found in verse 15 and in verse 23 and is conditional. You love me? If you love me, keep my commandments. If this is how it is, you love me, then do what I say. Keep my commandments. Abide in my word. You'll be my disciples indeed. And he says again in verse 23, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. That's keeping the commandments. If Anyone says they love loves me and they truly do, then they will keep my word and we will be in fellowship with one another. That's what he means when he says my father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. There's going to be that relationship there. There's going to be that fellowship there. And it's contingent upon keeping the commandments and keeping his word if you do it. If this happens, then this will be the result. Little words mean a lot. Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11. In Romans chapter 11, you have here the Apostle Paul talking and discussing about how that the Jews who rejected Christ can be accepted if they accept Jesus Christ on His terms, just because they are nationalistic Jews, just because they're descendants of Abraham, doesn't mean they're going to have a special place in God's kingdom. They have to obey the gospel just like the Gentile does. And so even though they were rejected as a nationalistic people because they had killed the Son of God, yet as individual Jews, they could be Christians just like the Gentiles. They have to obey the same Savior. And as a result, he says, Romans chapter 11 and verse 22, Therefore consider the goodness and severity of God on those who fell. Talking about those who rejected God, they fell. On those who fell, severity, His wrath upon them. But towards you, goodness, if, if you continue in His goodness, Otherwise, you also will be cut off. So here we have the nature of God revealed in Romans 11 and verse 22. You can consider, look at, consider this. The goodness and severity of God. The goodness of God provides salvation. The severity of God will show forth His wrath and His displeasure with sin. And because He is a God of justice, sin must be punished. Now, we have a choice to make. Are we going to avail ourselves of the goodness of God or His severity? 
And he says here in verse 22, if you continue in his goodness condition, if this, then you will receive his goodness. You will receive salvation. You will receive those blessing, blessings. And you will avoid his severity. None of us want to face the severity of God. We deserve it because of our sins. But God in His goodness has provided salvation. And so we can, we can be rescued from, we can be saved from the severity that we all deserve, but it's conditional based on that one little word, if you continue in His goodness. If. Conditional. If you continue in His goodness, then you will see the goodness of God. It's conditional. Galatians chapter 1. Little words mean a lot. Galatians chapter 1 verse 8 and 9. The Apostle Paul is writing to the churches of Galatia because they were removing themselves from the gospel of grace and salvation to a gospel that's based upon the works of the law of Moses. They were binding things like the law of Moses, uh, certain certain restrictions and certain uh, things like circumcision and certain aspects of the law of Moses that had already been fulfilled in Christ, those Christians were trying to hold on to those things and bind them on the other Christians. And he was concerned about them. He's saying in, in Galatians chapter 1, you're removed from the gospel of Christ and you're preaching another gospel. Anytime you add to the gospel or take away from it, you're preaching another gospel. In Galatians chapter 1, verse 8 and 9, Paul says, <coughs> Paul says this, But even if we, little words, if, but even if we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel to you than that which is preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. Anytime something is repeated in Scripture, it's an emphasis. And anytime something is repeated in Scripture back to back, there is a strong emphasis that this is something that we need to be careful of. That we don't preach any other gospel than the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he uses that small little word, and he says, if, if we preach another gospel, then we will be accursed. That word accursed means to be cut off from God. It means to be cut off from Him. Now notice the Apostle Paul included himself in this. Paul knew he could be lost. He recognized that. Paul was saved. He was in a saved condition uh, before God. He was a Christian. But he knew if he departed from the teaching of Christ and started preaching another gospel like those uh, in Galatia were preaching, he said we would be accursed if we, the apostles, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel. Just imagine an angel coming down from heaven in all the splendor and glory and begins to preach and give another gospel. Paul says that angel is accursed. Cut off from God. We have the everlasting gospel found in the Scriptures. It is unchangeable, even though people try to change it. It is unchangeable. It preaches the same as it did 2,000 years ago. And when people want to add to or take away from it, they are preaching another gospel. I saw a person just the other day on television talk about how that water baptism is not a part of the gospel. He is taking away from the gospel. And they're preaching another gospel. And according to the scripture, he's accursed. Unless he repents and comes to the Lord. He is preaching a gospel that is not the gospel of Jesus Christ because Jesus put baptism in the plan. It's his plan of salvation. In Mark 16, verse 15 and 16, he said, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that believes not shall be condemned. That's the words of Christ. To take away from that and say that baptism is not a part of the gospel is to detract from the true gospel. And if we add anything to it, 
our own rules or regulations, our own ceremonies, then we're just as bad as the Galatians to whom Paul was writing and telling them, if you do this, you will be accursed. And he says, if. Little words mean a lot. If. Colossians chapter 3. <clears throat> Colossians chapter 3. In the book of Colossians, the apostle Paul is, is writing to the brethren at Colossae. He's writing to them and he is exalting Christ in chapter 1 and chapter 2, showing that Jesus Christ is the very image of God, that Jesus Christ is deity, that Jesus Christ is the very creator of all things, that we're complete in Jesus Christ. We don't need to mix the gospel of Christ with man-made philosophy, man-made tradition. And he is saying all that. And then in chapters 3 and 4, he gives some practical matters. He says in chapter 3 and verse 1, If then you were raised with Christ, if, seek those things that are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above and not on things on the earth. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with Him in glory. So he starts off by saying, if then you were raised with Christ. That goes back to Colossians 2 and verse 12. We're buried with Him in baptism. Buried with Him in baptism. Romans chapter 6, Paul talks about we're raised from that watery grave of baptism to walk in newness of life. So if then you've been raised with Christ, you're raised from the waters of baptism, you start seeking those things that are above. Your focus now is on spiritual things. So many people are raised from the waters of baptism and they go back to the things that they were concerned about before. They have no spiritual progress. They have no spiritual growth. They don't have any concern about spiritual things. And they think simply because they were baptized that everything is okay. That's not true. We have to do this. If you've been raised with Christ from the waters of baptism... You seek those things which are above. And that phrase, seek those things, is a continuous action. You continuously continuously seek those things that are above, those spiritual things that are above throughout your life, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. You set your mind, verse 2, on things above. You're not concerned about the things here on, on earth. Because your citizenship is in heaven now. He says in verse 3, you have died. You've died to that old life. Your life is hid with Christ in God. You're now a part of the family of God. You're not now in a special relationship with God. He says, when Christ who is our life appears, then you also will appear with Him in glory. So he uses this word, if. That small word says, if this has happened, if you have been baptized into Christ and you have been raised to walk in newness of life, you seek things in a different direction now. Your concern now is to be concerned about spiritual things and not on things of this world. Little words mean a lot. Hebrews chapter 3. The Hebrew writer, whoever he may have been, writing to Hebrew Christians, that's why it's called Hebrews, was writing to them because they were leaving the faith to go back to Judaism, to go back to the animal sacrifices, to go back to the things of the law of Moses is kind of, kind of similar to the Galatian problem. And the Hebrew writer is explaining that Jesus is superior. His covenant is superior and far better. It's a new and living way. He's superior to Moses. He's superior to Joshua. He's superior to all the prophets. He's even superior to the angels. You read about that in Hebrews chapter 1. His covenant is a superior covenant. Why do you want to go back to something that's inferior and cannot bring ultimate salvation? Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 5, he talks about how that Jesus is superior to Moses. Hebrews 3 and verse 5, And Moses indeed was faithful in all his house as a servant, for a testimony of those things which uh, would be spoken afterwards, Moses in his house, talking about his family, he was faithful in all of his house. He was a faithful servant of the Lord. 
He accomplished the Lord's will. But he was just a servant. Notice verse 6. But Christ as a son. A son is greater than a servant. Christ as a son over his house. He's the son over his family. Notice what he says in verse 6. Whose house we are if we hold fast the confidence and rejoicing of hope firm to the end. That little word if. Whose house we are. He's talking about the church. And he says we are the house of the son. We're not the house of Moses. It's not the church of Moses. It's the church of Christ. It's the church that belongs to Him. And He's the Son over His house. And we are that house if, condition, we hold fast the confidence and rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. If you do this, then this will happen. Notice what He says in verse 7. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, quoting from the Old Testament, Today, if you hear His voice... Do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion in the day of trial in the wilderness where your fathers tested me and tried me and saw my works forty years. Verse 10, Therefore I was uh, angry with that generation and said, They always go astray in their heart and they have not known my ways. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Verse 12, Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. So the Hebrew writer here is saying, don't be like those Israelites of old who wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. They hardened their heart. Today, if you hear His voice, if you hear the Word of God, don't harden your heart. You know, one of two things will happen when you hear God's Word. Your heart will be tender and receptive and obedient. Or it will grow hard, defiant, and rebellious. That's the two things that will happen. The same message that is preached to the same audience in some, it will cause their hearts to become hard. We're not talking about the hardening of the arteries. We're not talking about the hardening of the blood pump. We're talking about your mind. Your mind becomes hard. It doesn't bother you to hear about sin. It doesn't bother you to hear that you're out of harmony with the will of God. It doesn't concern your conscience anymore. That's what he's talking about. And he says, if you hear his voice, if you hear God's word, don't become like that. You can become calloused to the point where you just don't care. It's like water on a duck's back. It just rolls off. And you can hear a message like that every Sunday after Sunday after Sunday and not make a move, not make a change that you know you have to make. And the Hebrew writer is saying, don't be like that. Because it was like those of old who were in the wilderness wanderings. They rebelled against me. And he said, I swore in my wrath they will not enter into Canaan's land. That's basically what he's talking about there. They will not enter into my rest. You know, out of the millions that came out of Egyptian bondage, Two went into the promised land. Joshua and Caleb. With a whole new generation. The original generation that came out of the Egyptian bondage did not go in because they were afraid of the giants. They were afraid of the inhabitants of the land. They didn't have their faith and trust in God. That God would fight their battles. That God would be with them as they go in and take the land that God told them to take. Therefore, they had to wander in the wilderness and that generation died out and a whole new generation came up led by Joshua and Caleb, the only two of the original that would enter into God's rest, enter into Canaan's land. And he says in verse 12, Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the little, the, the, the living God. So he's using this word. If, this small little word, if, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. First John chapter 1. Little words mean a lot. 
First John chapter one verses uh, six through ten, you find the apostle John using this little word "if" over and over and over and over again. If you do this, then this will happen. First John chapter one verses six through ten. If we say that we have no, uh, if we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. If we say that we are Christian, that we are living the Christian life, and we live in sin and darkness, uh, John says we're a liar. We're not practicing the truth. Verse seven. But if, again, condition. If we walk in the light, if we live in harmony with God's Word, as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. Verse 8, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If you say there is no sin in my life, you're just deceived in your own self, and the truth is not in us. Verse 9, if... We confess our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we confess with an attitude of repentance and walk in the light, we have the cleansing of the blood of Christ. And He cleanses us from all unrighteousness. It's not unconditional. It is conditional. Verse 10, If we say that we have not sinned, we make Him a liar and His word is not in us. So if you say, I have no sin in my life, then you're making God a liar. And your word, or excuse me, His word is not in you. You're not practicing the truth and you are self-deceived. You have deceived yourself. So all through 1 John chapter 1, you see that little word, if, and it makes the blessings of the cleansing blood of Jesus Christ, fellowship with God, fellowship with fellow saints, conditional. Condition on our response that we walk in the light, that we practice the truth, that we confess our sins. Little words mean a lot. Revelation chapter 22, verse 18 and 19. The close of inspiration. The very last words of inspiration. The close of the Scriptures. Revelation 22, verse 18 and 19, John gives a warning. He says, For I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. Verse 19. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city and from the things that are written in this book. If. Condition. If you add to the Scriptures the punishment that's found therein in the book of Revelation will be added to you. Why would someone want to add to God's Word? They must think it's deficient. They must think that it's lacking something. You need something extra. The 66 books of the Scripture is just, it's just not enough. We gotta have a creed. We gotta have a confession of faith. We gotta have a catechism. Why would you wanna add to the Scripture unless you think the Bible is just not enough? Then he says, if anyone takes away from the words of this book, you will be taken away from the book of life, from the holy city. And from the things written in the book, all the blessings that are found in the book of Revelation are not going to be yours. You're not going to go to heaven. Is basically what he's saying. You will be taken away from those things. So why would someone want to take away from the Scripture? Well, they don't like what a certain passage says or what a certain doctrine says. And so they delete it, so to speak. Oh, they may not go through and with a with a, a marker or with a white out and white it out, but in their own life. Yes, I like this, but I'm not going to do this. I like to sing praises to God, but I don't like to give upon the first day of the week. Or who are you to take away? I like to do this, but I don't want to do this. Pick and choose. We don't have that luxury. God has given His Word. 
And if we're not to take away from it, we're not to add to it. And John, by inspiration, said, if you do this, you'll be lost. Little words mean a lot. Over and over again, this is just a sampling of how the word if is used throughout the Scripture. We didn't even look in the Old Testament. Just a sampling of how this very small word conveys so much, so much meaning and so much in understanding what the Scriptures teach. If you're not a Christian this morning, then you need to obey the Gospel. Believe in Christ. Have faith in Him with all your heart. Confess that He is the Son of God. Repent of your sins. Be immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins. Acts 2 and verse 38. Acts 22 and verse 16. Then you will receive salvation. If you're not a faithful Christian, come back to the light. The promise of all these blessings, the promise of being a true disciple of Christ, the promise of having our sins cleansed continually by the blood of Christ is only for the faithful child of God. If you're not, then repent and come back to Him. As always, the choice is yours. While we stand and while we sing.